The Parenting Unpacked podcast is recorded in Yagara and Yagambe Banjalung land. We acknowledge the Turrbal, Yagara and Kumbamari people as its traditional custodians. We acknowledge all First Peoples of this land and celebrate their enduring connections to country, knowledge and stories. We pay our respects to the Elders, those who have passed into the dreaming, those here today and those of tomorrow. Hello and welcome back to Parenting Unpacked. I am Dr. Siobhan Kennedy Costantini and we have Dr. Kristen Summer. How are you, Kristen? I am fairly hanging in there. I don't know if it's hay fever yeah. or cold, but I am. I have sneezed and sniffled and blown my nose a million times um, in today's episode, but don't worry because I tried my hardest to mute myself every time so if there are awkward pauses it's me like figuring out the need to unmute myself (laughs) because I just uh Siobhan how are you (laughs) I'm doing pretty good thankfully I don't have any hay fever the weather at the moment has been really weird we had a really Mm -hmm. really hot day on Sunday Uh and did you guys get the storm that was supposed to come but was a pathetic excuse for a storm no, I was really looking forward it to was, it, but it didn't come. It wasn't. It didn't. Yeah, we got a bit of rain, but it wasn't what it promised. So in Australia, it's really common, particularly in Queensland. We have very hot summers. This summer has not been hot um, because of hashtag climate change. Um, but on Sunday, we had a really hot day and it's really common for hot summer days to be broken by an afternoon storm, with like a big electrical storm, like thunder and lightning and like drama. Um, and the way the weather felt on Sunday, we just felt like that was coming and it didn't, and it was really Mm -hmm. sad. And then it just stayed hot all night. Yep. To all our neurodivergent, um, listeners, I apologize for Siobhan's obsession with the weather. She is more neurotypical than us. (laughs) I love, wait, do you, do you think the weather's boring? (laughs) It's small talk. Like such small talk. It's, it's boring. Okay. I'm sorry, but no, that's okay whatever. because I still, I still. Summer I storms still, are exciting. I love Summer your, I love your exciting. interests. I do. I love your interests, and I will support <laughs> them. I just, you know, I just like as I was listening to you, I was like, lol, at how much like I hate talking about the weather. Like, let's talk about your deepest, darkest trauma. Um, the first um, moment we talked. I've already, like, I've done that all the time. Well, okay, I'm trying to think of <laughs> this anything. Is why I have we have a podcast like talk. this. No, I it's know. okay. Um, I love you as you are. It's fine. I just thanks. we you laid know, I, turf. That's not exciting either. That's <laughs> more small talk. We laid some turf on the weekend. Oh my um, god. I have nothing deep or dark. I'm sorry. Oh my god, you're just so <laughs> mentally balanced and neurotypical this week. Not, I'm just like not. Really. I don't know how to feel about this it. This week I am. This week That's I am. I mean. It's okay, yeah. friends, because I am less mentally balanced. Um, I had a <laughs> had a panic attack at my father's 60th birthday because mm. I was cutting the cake. That was not what caused the panic attack. It was the sensory overload and exhaustion from like the previous 24 hours. But, you know, I was cutting a cake and my um, brother's girlfriend was like, so how's work going as I'm cutting the cake? Um, And like, I kept asking people like how I should cut the cake. And I think that was the final like failure, like failure to have a decision that broke like Mm. my, my soul. Uh, And she was just like asking me how work went. And like, I was like standing there holding this knife with my eyes closed, breathing in. And I was like, nope, I can't stop this one. And I was like, said to her, I was like, good, but I'm having a panic attack and put the knives down and walked away. (laughs) So I'm still mentally unbalanced and that is okay. Look, it's, it absolutely is okay. But isn't it so great that you're doing really well at like identifying your needs and letting the people know that you just need a time Mm -hmm. to step away. Yeah. Yeah, It was the, like, that's a big panic. I haven't had that kind of panic attack in a really long time. Mm. That's the kind of panic attack that took me out for three and a half hours at my wedding. Um, Mm. Like it, it, when they come on that fast and strong, I'm just like, well, I'm fucked, but no, I'm not. Because like when I was going through this panic attack, Like it was, I had to walk to the bathroom and like, I'm usually pretty good at not having to leave where I am anymore, but it was a party. It was loud. There was people that I wasn't like, it was all small talk anyways. Um, Hence my (laughs) diversion for small talk (laughs) this week in particular, my my levels of tolerance are low. Um, But yeah, I put myself in a bathroom and like not the bathroom that people like use, but my parents' bathroom because it was at their house because I know that people won't go into my parents' room to use that bathroom. So I knew I wouldn't be interrupted because that makes me Mm -hmm. way more anxious. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I disappeared into the bathroom, felt like I was going to vomit and pass out. And I was just like, 
I know what this is. I know how it started. I felt it start. And I was talking to myself about all the things that would have like triggered this panic attack, how it's not me being sick. It's not like something that's uncontrollable. And I just like started up this mantra of like, you've got this, you've got this, you know what you're doing. It's just a panic attack. You've got this. And within five minutes, I took my panic attack that would have taken me out for hours to nothing. It was just gone. I still went home because I'm compassionate with myself. And like I had a child and it was 7 p.m. And it was time for her to go to bed anyways. And I was like, you know what? That's fine. But I like usually wouldn't have been able to leave the bathroom for hours, um, which is not something you can do when you have a child um, to Mm. look after at a party where you're, you know, anyways. So I did a great thing, but also my tolerance levels at the moment are quite low. Um, I so I apologize that. for picking on you about the weather. I still love no, it. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't mind at all. Um, it's, I don't mind in the slightest. Um, we talked about in today's episode, we talked about um, decision fatigue. And I had an awesome story I wanted to share with you that um, is like a perfect example of like when I was at the most decision fatigued that I can remember. I think Timo was about like four or five months old, maybe, maybe six months. Anyway, he was little. And we were living in an apartment complex of like six apartments. And on apartment number one was this little girl, Stella. And she, at the time, she was like six. And we'd go out into the garden and sometimes she'd come and join and play with us because she loved babies. And this one particular day, I was just done. Um, My effort of like doing anything was I'm outside on grass. I'm just going to lie on the grass and the baby can eat grass. I don't care. And then... Stella like was the best she went I think he wants to swim and so she got out a little paddling pool and she filled it up and then she said no he needs to dip his and I was still there she's like and he needs to dip his feet now um and that and she just like full-on like took control in the best way and planned my afternoon she's like he needs this he needs this I think he's hungry can you feed him now and like just it was exactly what I wanted and needed and this little six-year-old just plant like controlled my life for a couple of hours and it was I remember the sense of relief that washed over me like someone's in control yes she might be a six-year-old but she's got this on lock it was it was the best that is like truly brilliant but also like we all need a Stella in our life sometimes when we We all need Stella when we're that exhausted and we just we can't carry the load of figuring out the next activity to entertain our highly sensitive fussy in pain irritable baby we just need someone else to take the reins and if that happens to be a six-year-old like power to her like she has got this covered like six-year-olds have such great like little brains they're not as exhausted as ours and they're like Mm -hmm. what about this and this would be cool and it's just like that's that's magic right there yeah so yeah if you have a neighborhood child who is six um first ask their parents (laughs) then (laughs) then uh entice them to and help you entertain your baby her dad came out and he's like i hope she's not bothering you i'm like oh no she's she's (laughs) saving me she's the best (laughs) please know that she is doing a great job of parenting my child so that i don't have to (laughs) exactly (laughs) is this why people have second children maybe like but then isn't there more just, I don't know. Anyways, we're not talking yes. about that today because it's, it's like, not a perfect solution. We've done two episodes on um, parenting second children or not parenting, but expecting them. Instead, today's episode, we talked to Dr. Laura Gange, who is at Science for Women, Science for Women or Science, Science for, all, for women. all Women? For All at Women. Science for All Women. On Instagram. She is another scientist come social media science translator. Um, she works primarily in the area of like holistic sleep and holistic parenting, which is just another term for gentle parenting or gentle sleep sort of it, but it, she takes a more like, um, scientific approach, which is basically just observe and watch and mm-hmm. recognize patterns, Makes which is really brilliant. Small incremental changes. Which have humongous impact. And we had the best chat. Like I feel really good after that chat and I am Laura, like sent me, a, sent us an email thanking us um for being on and that she like had a rough start to her day and after our chat she was just like motivated which makes me feel so good that's nice because this chat friends is it should make everyone feel good it's just I don't know I feel good (laughs) 
you know, as, and I mean, we've already, we've already booked her in for another, at least sent her the link to book in for another chat. We liked it so much. So we hope that you guys mm. enjoy it just as much as we did. You guys don't get to say anyway, she's coming back. <laughs> <laughs> I, I refuse, I refuse to not have Laura back in my life. Um, but anyways, um, I don't think there's much more for us to talk about. Um, we will chat to you again after the uh, interview with Laura, which was more just a chat um, because none of our interviews are ever interviews. They're all chats. But we shall see you at the uh, tail end of this episode. Enjoy. We have the most marvellous Dr. Laura Gainsh um, joining us today. Laura, welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, as always, like we've chatted a bit with Siobhan before, it's nice to have Christine here and um, I can't wait to dig into whatever we have on store today. Mm, I'm very yeah, excited. I think, Laura, you... oh, yeah, we all are. I think Laura was um, maybe the first like fellow scientist that I actually followed on Instagram way back when. Um, and we um, chat a lot and share lots of similar wonderful views. But before we jump into our questions, um, can you tell us a bit about yourself, Laura? Who are you? Who are you a mum to? Um, what's your work? What's your passion? What do you do with yourself? Right. So originally, I'm a geneticist who went uh, towards human physiology for my PhD. So I did a kind of a drastic change at that point. Um, and so, yeah, I'm one of the few, I think in our community, we have some psychologists who do more uh, child research. I'm more on the biology side of the sleep. Um, and so then I, you know, for me, I'm, I'm really a researcher at heart, like for sure, 100%. I didn't end up accidentally in the research. Um, and so I never thought that I would kind of change again, though I feel like it also goes with the research kind of side, you know, you kind of go with the flow. Um, and so when I became a mom, I, and, and it's funny, cause I think Christine, you have a, a reel about that, but I was bombarded by people because I'm the sleep person, right? It's like, wait, uh, my baby, uh, the sleep, sleep stuff. And I gave some kind of what I felt was kind of common sense knowledge more because I am an experimentator and with my daughter, I would just try things. Um, and some moms literally would come back to me and be like, wow, my daughter like literally was not sleeping in her crib for naps and in two weeks. And I'm like, excuse me, what did you just say? Um, and I really got pushed by other moms to kind of be like, uh, give more information. And th this has always been my thing, which is why I love your podcast. Um, is I want to give the information so that um, moms, especially, uh, you know, women power can make their decision informed and know what they want to do with their specific family. So, um, yeah, and I'm a mom of a seven year old now, and I also have two fur babies, which matter a lot to me as well. Uh, and I live in Japan and I'm French Chilean. So that's uh, kind of uh, a lot. <laughs> That's what, what's a beautiful summary of a, a complex and wonderfully diverse background, which is awesome. I um, had a quick question for you that I might um, start off with because I, I know the answer and I think it's a great one um, to be shared. And so um, for those who don't know, Laura um, works with works in sleep. She works in holistic sleep, looking at ways to gently um, and w with the power of evidence and um, information uh, make changes that better suit you and your family to help with sleep. But um, you have probably one of the best definitions of sleep training that I've heard, particularly because when it comes to sleep and sleep training versus gentle sleep and all these kinds of things, these are terms that are not regulated at all. And everyone has different versions of what those things mean. But I was wondering um, if you could share yours. Right. You scared me for a moment. I was like, <laughs> wait, what did I, what did I say? <laughs> okay. So for me, sleep training is basically any kind of method that is rigid where it's going to be, we, we don't adapt to whatever changes may come. So um, even if we just decide on a specific schedule and that would be for sleep, but also for breastfeeding or actually feeding in general, um, for me, that's, 
some kind of training that mostly doesn't work for every single child. Um, so I would say that's for me is sleep training. Obviously you have levels and then, you know, let's say severity of um, the intensity that you are going to be rigid with it. But in general, I think that the main problem with the sleep industry is that it's like you expect one method to work for a million babies. And it's like already no method works for adults. There's no way that one method will work for kids. Absolutely. I absolutely Kristen. agree. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. I was going to ask you what you thought. So go. Perfect. <laughs> Siobhan and I are notoriously bad at talking over the top of each other. And we had agreed that we were going to switch off on questions, Siobhan. So let's try and switch off I on know. questions. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just chewing Siobhan out a little bit uh, live I on air. That's on fine. There. But um, Laura, I think that's really brilliant. And that's a really like like level-handed way of describing um what is gentle uh, no what is sleep training versus what is not sleep training and I'm actually really curious because you have a biology background um we've had a sleep uh, gentle sleep kind of scientist on here recently we had Jess from infant sleep scientist but she's mm -hmm. um, more the same field as Siobhan and I more the child development cognitive development kind of side so I'd love to hear how biology has informed your understanding of infant sleep and how that informs your practice of like uh, walking parents through these experiences. Right. So um, I just wanted to add one thing for, you know, because I don't know, I think a lot of parents listen to here. The first thing, the, the other thing I wanted to say about sleep training is I will never judge someone who did it because as we said at the beginning, I don't think we have enough information out there. And my current, actually my current goal is really to bring, um, you know, proper holistic sleep mainstream because I still feel like it's not <laughs> um but yeah if one of the listeners has sleep trained and feel bad about it like I don't think it's your fault um and I think that you know the more I did some mistakes I tried sleep training it was only two minutes and a half because I was like no way but you know you 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 live and you learn and the more you grow with your child and also that's how I feel like some parents are guilty feel guilty about their first child versus their, their second um you get a bit better parent every day, like every single day, and it'll only get better. Um, so regarding your question, I think for me, it was really what I was saying, like experimenting. Um, having experimented as a biologist, I never expected something to just work. I was just like, um, it made sense for me that it would take some time and that there would be uh, a lot of things that at first did not make sense for my baby that eventually would make sense. So for example, um, for naps, I remember I decided to start putting her in her crib um, every day for every single sleep and it would never work for like months and months and months. Like it was just like, she would stay for 10 seconds. She would hate it. I would take her out and boob her to sleep, you know, <laughs> the usual, but I kept going and going and going. And I kept, it's, it's funny because they talk about the six months and I hate it because I'm like, there's no exact date, except it was for her at six months <laughs> where, where it was like, suddenly she would stay in her crib longer and longer and accept it longer and longer. And then one day it took her 40 minutes and she passed out in her crib and she was very happy, but she, there was this developmental readiness or she felt happier and happier in her environment, or she felt more happier and happier separate from me. But it, there was ne ne there was nothing overnight. There was nothing that was like, ooh, I trained my baby in three days or whatever was going on. I don't know what currently the, <laughs> the most popular sleep training method is. Um, I think that was the main thing, like experimenting. I also remember that... Um, I used to, so my baby was not a quick breastfeeder. Like it was always like an hour minimum. <laughs> I don't know the five minutes, the five minutes breastfeeders. I'm always like, what? Like, how does that work? <laughs> that was me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember um, after a few nights, I was trying to have her fall asleep on the breast and in my arms and she was just not having it. And so I ended up putting her back on her sleep surface and she would fall asleep much easier that way. And I don't mean that in like, 
this is the way to go, right? It was just like this instinct that we talk about. I was like, why shouldn't I try just now? Because it sounds like this would work for her. Um, and I will add, my baby was a crib baby. I know it is not, it is not the norm. Um, and also that was only at night for naps. It was never easy in the crib or whatever and stuff like that. So um, I think really the experimenting was the main thing that came from being a researcher, being a scientist where I did not expect things to work. And I just was like, I'll try until it works or not. <laughs> I think that's such a great point. And I think that's such a good attitude to have a parenting in general, right? Like it, it works until it doesn't. And sometimes it never does. And you just have to constantly keep trying. I think um, like, and I, as, as people, as humans, we're so desperate for patent seeking and like trying to find patterns and find a method in the madness, but there rarely is. Um, and sometimes you just have to go with the flow. And then we, we get lulled into a false sense of security because security, eventually some pattern does develop. And by the time we've noticed it, it then changes. So it's um, ch raising children is a cruel mistress and it's a hard work, but I think you're totally right that being having that research background kind of um, and data that doesn't cooperate um, or doesn't do what you expect it to do is a really great um, example <laughs> of, of not knowing what to do with things. I just You're have to zone in. Christian, what? I have to zone in on what you said, having data that doesn't cooperate. I feel like that's a scientist. Thing. I know. Like, it makes me giggle because data is child and child does not cooperate. Yeah. <laughs> child does not cooperate. It's so true. Well, I thought you were going to call me out for data. It's just data. It doesn't cooperate or not no, cooperate. No, I it think is it's what brilliant. it is. I think it's brilliant. And but also like children are also children and they it's uh, exactly. just play. <laughs> and it's interesting exactly. because um, as scientists, I think we know this, like we know that the science shows us diversity. And um, one of my saying is normal equals diversity. But mm. the thing is, people from the outside of science thinks that science is one answer or one fact and that there's one truth. Um, and I think we talked about that the first time we we talked in your Beauty in the Grey kind of series, Siobhan, but mm -hmm. um, for me, one important thing that I say before most of kind of my presentation is um, science is not a fact. We are only always going closer to the truth and it evolves every single day. So stop mm -hmm. saying like, this is it. This is fact. Like, I first of all, I hate this. It's like fact. This this is how is it? It is. And it's like, no, it's not. And don't use science to say that. I completely disagree. Yeah. Oh, you're absolutely right. I really liked your example of like the fact that your daughter decided that feeding to sleep one night wasn't how she wanted it. My little one did the same. I rocked him to sleep until he was about 18 months old. And that was my preferred method because it was quote unquote, the easiest way. And then one day he literally rolled out of my arms onto the bed and was like, no, pat me. And I was like, oh, okay. And I tried and I, I resisted it. I'll be honest, I completely resisted it and was like, no, 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 we rock to sleep. I don't pat, this will take longer. Um, and then he was not, he's a very determined little one. He had, would have nothing to do with it. And I was like, oh, okay, we have to change how we do things. And I was not prepared to do it, but he forced the issue. And I think that's one of the best ways to like think about these things is that we don't get to control things. And that children are such a beautiful reminder of the fact that life is not controllable, that we don't get to have things in perfect, neat little boxes all the time. Um, kind of, I guess this is a good segue in terms of the fact that culturally we do things so differently. And obviously you're French Chilean. I know that you live in Japan, you lived in Australia. I would love to hear your, your take on how different cultures have different approaches to children's sleep. It's wild. Honestly, it's wild mm -hmm. um, for so many reasons. I feel like there's lots of positive and there's lots of negative. Um, I'm actually currently like I got a book deal and I'm I, it's yeah. going to be a French book. Um, but suddenly I was like, wait, I've been out of France for so long. I have no idea what the parenting world, like, you know, more or less, you know, but it's like exactly what is said in France. And I was like, Ooh, I have to catch up on all that. Um, but I would say, um, in Japan, obviously, everyone knows bed sharing is very common. I think it's still up to 40% of families who bed share here. Um, what's really interesting is that it's, um, it's not, it's not a choice. <laughs> like, and I think that makes a huge difference because 
Um, when you, well, first of all, in terms of safety, which is a problem, because when you do it by choice, especially I would say in America, uh, or maybe even in Australia, um, you're going against the grain, right? And you're told you're going to kill your child if you're bad share. So probably you're going to be a bit more informed as to what, how to do it. Um, here, not really. So I, I, I don't really like that aspect where it's like, uh, this is how we have to do it. Um, the other thing is it's it's the the mothering, I would say, is very kind of um, how to say um, again, like you're doing it because you have to, but you don't really choose the way you do it. So like there there's really kind of this group effect where everyone does thing, but it, you really have this double sides in Japan where it feels like it's very, holistic and gentle because you have a lot of carrying and stuff but then um, there's this huge disconnection in terms of like emotions and um, because in Japan you're not supposed to have too much emotions you need to look a certain way etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, so that I think is not something many people know because in the holistic world we're like oh Japan wow <laughs> um but you have a lot of like, and I, if I if I give my my husband as an example, like when we met, it was a big clash because I'm French, like I have all the emotions, and I'm not gonna, you know, shut up about it. Uh, whereas he's like, he he didn't even know what he was feeling. Like it was really mm. interesting because he couldn't even put a name on it. Um, so I think this is kind of difficult for children again because also they will feel this it's like oh I'm so close to my mom she carries me everywhere but I can't cry or I'm not allowed to cry and um, there's also this kind of again and I would say that's something I've seen elsewhere like you know this idea of like gentle parenting is permissive um, mm. so in Japan you will have this idea that because school is a bit sorry it's a bit stereotypically stereotypical that I'm saying that but it's a little bit like army here like you know you have to follow the orders and stuff so parents tend to be extremely permissive to kind mm. of compensate for like the school environment and again I feel like that's kind of really harsh on kids it's like oh okay you could do everything you wanted and suddenly you have to stop um so that's very interesting to me um and I, I love all the bed sharing stuff but I also feel like we lack balance like I really want and we talked about this a lot in your series like and I love the fact that you said beauty in the gray because it's not gentle permissive or strict sleep training like we really have to find a middle ground and show all the 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 diversity that's in between but also and I would say even personally like lacking boundaries is not a good thing it doesn't bring any happiness <laughs> yeah absolutely I find that really interesting I um when I was in high school I would have been 15 I went and spent three months living in Japan um, and I lived with a Japanese family and I found the cultural dichotomy really interesting. I went to school every day and it was very rigid and structured. They were very high achievers. They studied constantly. I would come home from school and like expect to hang out and like there was no family interaction. Like this might just have been my school, but there was no family interaction. There was no connection. It was just come home from school, go upstairs and study. And these are obviously teenagers. Um, but it was so interesting. The only time we ever spent together was um, for like, we lived in a multi-generational household. So one night a week, we'd go to the grandparents side of the house and we'd have dinner with the grandparents. Um, otherwise I didn't see the parents. I didn't see the child unless it was pre-specified time. So it was a very interesting dichotomy than like a loud, messy, chaotic household that I came from when I had four siblings at the time. Um, and it was just, it's a very different kind of culture that raises a different kind of child. And I always find it very interesting that we tend to play in this space, both as science communicators, but also as scientists where it's mostly English and therefore mostly Western research. And we almost never have this accessibility to the research from other cultures. So I do find like your particular experience incredibly interesting because you have such a diverse background of cultures and experience um so it's really interesting to hear 
from you what you've observed in um France what was child rearing like there so I feel like it's it's a little bit of a mixture but they would still be quite rigid so like the idea of I mean this common idea of like if you don't do it now you mess up your child and your the parent is messed up I would say it's still pretty ingrained um in my family personally it was like there's no like it's it was prohibited to be in my parents bed um and I remember and it's really interesting because they're my parents are very opposite my dad is very strict and rigid and my mom is very cuddly um but it was my dream my mom's dream to have a child um and she ended up never sleeping with me ever and she breastfed for only th three months because then she went back to work full time so when one of, I was one of those babies who went straight to daycare you know from 7 to 6 p.m I don't know um really early on so and I think that's still pretty common um which I completely understand, like I feel, and, and that's one thing that's really important for me on my platform is for parents to understand that I'm not going to tell them, change your life, you know, stop working, <laughs> you know, like um, spend three hours a day with your child, even if you, you know, this is not what it is. Um, but also when I look at my own family, I feel like the times that we were together, we we sh it would have been better to prioritize those as family time. And this is not something that my parents knew how to do, I would say. Um, and I feel like it's still pretty common where it's like, oh, you know, um, this uh, maybe I would say maybe that's something common in all cultures. Like we really do not prioritize that five minutes of 100% one-on-one -on -one time where you're actually present. Um, and I think a lot of parents do not even understand how they will also enjoy it if they're hundred percent. Like I noticed that because it's like, oh, I really want to have my free time. But then I actually go into it. I look at my daughter as an individual, not as my daughter. And then I'm like, she's really interesting. She's actually really fun. Like, and then this will affect how she sleeps at night because she's had this connection this attachment that's reinforced and she's like oh my mom actually likes spending time with me she cares about what I think she cares about me as an individual um her confidence is at the moment going through the roof and th that's also like something I've observed like um <clears throat> I've heard a lot about it after you know after all my scientific background I did more like baby sleep certifications and stuff like that where they talked about the importance of having um, adults around the kids more than kids around the kids um, that was life-changing for my daughter like and she because I managed to have her in a very small structure where all the attention was on her and she was like look at me I'm so proud I love myself like um, she's really she's really girly which I don't know where that came from I don't know if you you ladies have observed that but I've observed that in a few of my friends and clients as well where it's like one day bam she's like they decide their style and it's over and my daughter is really like pretty over comfortable and I'm like I do not understand that <laughs> Um, but I remember I used to be like that, but I was not comfortable because I, mm -hmm. I felt like, you know, I, I want to do that, but I don't feel it. My daughter is going to be the only one dressed up for photo day, like pink and <laughs> ribbons everywhere. She'll add a little fake pearls around her neck and she'll rock it. She'll be like, yeah, Amazing. that's me. Yeah. And so that's, that's um, so good. yeah, I think, and that, My that's, that's how sleep works as well. It's like all of mm. this emotional work then will translate into the nights. I no, you're so right. I think um, regarding the the um, girliness, my little boy is a boy's boy. I like have. I mean, he has he plays with dolls and he has access to other things. But I have kind of this vision of like raising this really sen and he is sensitive. But raising this kind of like not gender fluid, but kind of super. Um, you know what I mean? Like, and no, he's into trucks. He's into dinosaurs. He's into sharks. He went, he was looking for Halloween costumes and he's pulling out like all of these 
um, construction outfits. And I'm like, maybe you want to be a mermaid. He's like, he just looked at me. I was like, why would you suggest such a silly thing? And I'm like, okay, fine. I'm, I'm trying to change you. Either. So I'm doing the opposite of what I profess to be. If you want to be a construction worker, be a construction worker. Um, and yeah, he's all into like his superheroes and it's just funny to see. And I, regarding the, the pull on pinkness, because I am not a pink girly girl either at all. And I, um, remember when I was pregnant before we knew we were having a little boy uh, we saw we were at the shops me and my husband and we saw this girl in this big tutu and a tiara and I said to him I'm like ugh, I will never let my daughter wear something like that and thankfully he appropriately chastised me and said no if that's what she wants to wear that's what she will wear I'm like ugh. so <laughs> I think it's hilarious that you struggle but as you say that she's like so in her own skin and so happy with it which is so interesting I was I totally like you I was totally like you with this idea of gender fluidity like she was literally wearing you know like boys clothes and stuff it did not work like she's she's <laughs> not she's not fluid but it's her own choice you know you do yeah, you they, do you but I have also a lot of friends where you know I was going to give them some clothes and they're like no I don't really like skirts I'm like wait for it um maybe <laughs> not but wait for it and then it happened and she was like yeah I couldn't fight it anymore and I'm like I'm sorry this is what happens you kind of have to follow the flow yeah definitely I think it's like it's really beautiful that kids have this like confidence and expression and it seems to like over the years get a bit beaten out of them. So I really hope that the new attitudes towards gender fluidity or just being who you want to be really continue to permeate our culture and support our children in like pursuing their creativity and desires instead of um, kind of squashing them and turning them into little um, industrial workers um I however did get the child that is very fluid she definitely oscillates between mm. tutus and tiaras and spider-man outfits um pretty much awesome. every day the whole day is yep yeah, we get the whole spectrum um but there is something I wanted to hone in on Laura because I know from my um time on the internet talking to parents that sometimes that focus time can be really really hard to do with your parent with your child because you may not know how to play or they might have competing things or it might just be a factor of planning like I know that for my brain I need to plan I need to be like okay kiddo what are we doing when you get home from daycare today to make sure that I have an activity planned that gives me guidance and structure so that I can connect. So what do you do and what do you see as things that can help parents facilitate that connection time rather than being like, go and connect for 10 minutes a day, because then it becomes like a prescription and a chore, but like, how can we help make that happen? Yeah, I have to agree with you. Like I I think almost every day if I don't plan and decide that that's what I'm going to do, I am going to be like half halfway there. Um the thing is that you there's there's hopefully you know, I'm kind of like we have a very early bedtime um because that's what worked for my daughter and we had to kind of stop naps early because she's kind of one of those persons and we can talk about that a little bit because you know there's kind of stuff about weight windows and people are like weight windows are magical and stuff again my daughter falls into the very strict weight windows extremely strict weight windows uh like by five minutes you know it's like no nope, it's missed it's gone <laughs> uh but that's not all the kids and so um we ha I have to be very organized at the end of the day because it's going to be like, you know, we get we get back from school, we need a snack if we have homework, stuff, 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 blah, blah, blah. But the thing is, I always know that even if I miss the, the coming back to school kind of one on one, um, I have what we call in my house, the hug, hug talk um, at bedtime. And mm. this is something that we always do because I know that if I don't, um, my daughter is highly sensitive, overthinker, everything you can imagine. Um, she's not going to fall asleep. As simple as that. Because she will have stuff that have happened during the day that obviously she will remember only at the last minute <laughs> before sleep <laughs> and that she will need to evacuate. Um, so I know that every day there's still one moment that we have, um, even if it's just before bed, 
where we will exchange at that moment. She will feel that I care about whatever big deal is going on at school at the moment. Um, and so for some families, and that's the other thing, it depends on, um, like, for example, I was working with a mom recently, um, her child had literal aversion for any kind of sleep time, whether it's naps or evening, like it was really, really bad. So we had to really create more playing with the bedtime um, that worked with her and, and the, the daughter's preference so that um, she wouldn't hate it anymore. And she wouldn't go into this fight or flight before sleep, which is just, your child's not gonna sleep in that, in that state, you guys know. Um, and so, it, depending on the family, it'll be maybe, so for us, it's going to be the hug talk and that's enough. Um, if she is in a really bad place, so like over the summer, she had a lot of things happen, but she had panic attacks. It was really, really, really bad. So I had to infuse way more time um, and plan for it again, because that, that was that period. And again, we have to think about it. It's not linear, right? Sometimes they will need more. Sometimes they will need less. Um, the last thing I would say that's the most important, probably the most, most, most important tip is you have to find stuff that you like to do as well, because, for example, I was working with another mom, and um, we have here those, uh, those passionate people about trains, you know, like, you have the anime fans, but you have the train fans who go and take pictures of all the trains. It starts really young. So you have little kids who are obsessed with trains and will spend hours watching the trains and stuff. Um, and so her little boy loved trains. She hated it. <laughs> she was like, I hate <laughs> the trains. I don't want to play trains anymore. And I'm like, then don't, don't do it. She, and so she managed to have the dad play with the trains more and she was doing something else. That was one huge change in her life where she was mm. like, okay, I don't have to do this thing with my child that I hate so that I can reconnect with my child. And again, change this vision of like, I have to take care of you, but I actually like to take care of you. I can see you as a different person. And um, in her case, she felt like she was not a mom and she really developed this bond. And it was really, really crazy mm. to see the change because at the end she was like the biggest change throughout the work we did together is that I'm proud to be a mom I feel I have this mom bond and I was like oh my goodness and so these are all some little steps but do things that you like to do with your child and ditch everything that you hate to do with your child that's absolutely brilliant and perfect and I think often as parents um, we get stuck into this kind of like martyr complex of like our children need us so we have to give everything to them and in in some ways that's true and some ways we do definitely have to put their needs above ours but we have to remember that we are people too and like if exactly like you say if we are doing something that is really either really boring or really frustrating or that we just do not enjoy we're not going to give our kids the kind of connection that they're wanting out of that moment so finding and like if if her little one's so obsessed with trains he's going to play with trains like it's not like he's not going to do it if she's not there with him so it's not like he's going to lose that love it's just that she'll be able to do something that she actually enjoys I remember even before I had kids way before I had kids I um uh followed this like Mormon mommy blogger which is really weird because I'm not really into that but she was awesome she had like six kids and she was great and she had a really like sensible attitude to child rearing that I really liked. But she always talked about how if you give kids 10 minutes, they'll give you an hour. And I think like that really speaks to the beauty of finding those times to connect. And I love how you talked about how you have them like built into your day. We also have like a bedtime cuddle ritual and we talk. I mean, my little one's only three. So his capacity for cogent conversation is lacking. But we talk. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, but we... Um, I think, like you say, like building it into your day and building like redundancies. So we have, we often have like a chat in the morning, but if we miss it, it's okay. Cause I know that we'll have another chat when I pick him up from daycare um, or like we have them, like, like you say, if, if, if you miss the hug talk, it's a disaster. But if you have other ones, then as long as you like hit the compulsory ones, you kind of, you know, set up in a good stead. Um, I forgot my question again. I had it in my head. Uh, yeah, I wanted to go back just for a minute on the wake windows topic, because we talk a lot about this. And at the moment, I feel like besides sleep training methods, which is like, you know, separate your child so they learn to sleep independently, which we can talk about next. Um, 
the wake windows is one of the biggest thing where people are like, Ooh, wake windows are magical. Like just do this timing and then your baby will sleep. And it's like at this age, do this time and next age, blah, blah, blah. Um, I personally have observed three kind of profiles. So as I said, my daughter is highly sensitive and I have noticed that highly sensitive kids or maybe neurodivergent, not sure. I, I can't classify it all because I haven't seen it all, but um, they're more strict with their wake windows. Um, might some, there's always exceptions, of course. Um, so in terms of my daughter, it was really like by five minutes, like you can't miss it and you can't, she will never fall asleep five minutes before, like this is not going to happen. Um, I wouldn't say that's the most common. So um, I would say the most common is some kids have wake windows that are way more flexible. It's like more or less, you know, half an hour plus minus that works. Um, but then there's the other two profiles that no one talks about. Uh, one is the absolutely flexible kids who do not care whatsoever about wake windows, about times, like they'll fall asleep whenever, wherever. Um, okay, maybe not wherever. Some kids are still specific to where they sleep and that's another kind of characteristic, but um, they can sleep after two hours, after three hours, and they're still good to go. And also that's the biggest thing, which never happened to me. Um, even if they have a late nap, they'll go back at bedtime at the same time as usual. And that's for me is like, but they exist. So, <laughs> and I have, uh, I have had clients where it was like, oh yeah, we observed that actually her nap didn't affect her bedtime as much, but they had this idea again, those more popular ideas in their mind where it's like, oh, that we shouldn't be doing that where no, if it works for you, why wouldn't you? Um, and then the third profile is actually kids who follow the time of the day. And that's mm. also another, so it doesn't matter the amount of time that they sleep, but they want to sleep at specific times of the day. Um, and they're very like their clock, um, not like, of course, biological clock, we all have it, but like, I know my body doesn't know time. I don't know time. <laughs> at all like you can tell me now it's 5 p.m I'll, I'll be like sure no it's yeah it's you know 2 p.m um but those kids know time and they'll always fall back asleep at the same time often they'll wake up at the same time in the morning every day and um and so I feel like it's really important to see again those profiles you can also have some mismatch mix and match between these profiles uh, but it's not just wake windows. Like I'd really like this myth to die out because not all babies mm. work on that. That's Absolutely. perfect. But you know, I remembered my my question was about um, highly sensitive and temperaments, but you've already answered it. So wonderful, you <laughs> answered my question without me even having to ask it. That's how great you are. Honestly, Thank just you. answering by osmosis. But I think that's brilliant. I have, <laughs> I definitely have a child that sits in the final one, which is she knows the time of day and she will just drop hours of sleep if for some reason she goes to bed late because she'll still get up at the same time every morning mm -hmm. or she'll like go to bed at the same time every day, even if she'd had a lot of sleep during the day, which doesn't happen very often because, oh, day naps at the moment are hard. Um, mm. I wish they'd stop letting her sleep at daycare, but it's against the law to not let them sleep. <laughs> um, they have to let them sleep for 20 minutes in Australia. Um, before oh, really? they can like, like, yeah, it's a minimum. If they fall asleep, it's a minimum 20 minutes before you're allowed to wake them up. I know this oh, because no. we, wow. yeah. we're not at that stage yet, but we're not, get, we're not far off of like, mm. he shouldn't sleep in the day. He, yeah. She like really disruptive. shouldn't. Yeah. Um, and I, do you know what? Cause I work, I work in daycares and mm. today I saw the, like the kindy kids all going down for a nap and I'm thinking, oh no, my little one, if he's sleeping at four, we're in trouble because he's yeah. kind of now <clears throat> at the stage where anyway, look, uh -huh. I shouldn't go borrowing problems, but um, they let at daycare, they let him sleep for two hours the other day, which is fine. Um, I get it. They've got uh -huh. lots, I know they've got lots going on and like, I don't begrudge them. You couldn't pay me enough to do their job. Um, but yeah. I'm sitting there going, no, it's not too bad. I'm, I'm being dramatic. It usually pushes his sleep time at night out by like a half hour or an hour max. So it's not disastrous. Yeah. But the other day he missed, he didn't nap on the weekend and he went to bed at 5.30, which is oh ridiculous. God. But it was <laughs> awesome. We watched a movie. Oh, that's we had so dinner much together free time. And we watched a movie. And because I'm pregnant, I've been going to bed so early because I'm so tired. I got to go to bed by 7.30 and it was 
I felt like a whole new person. I also felt lame, but that's okay. I don't need to worry about that. Um, <laughs> you need to stop anyway. feeling like the person you used to be. You are not a night I owl. I know. Stop identifying I'm, as a night owl. You I, are not one. I, it's such a part of my identity, but it's not <laughs> my it. reality. You're about to have another child. Remove it. You are now oh, an early, I know. early sleeper, early riser. I know. And then by the time I'm like free to sleep when I want, I'll be an old lady and old people go to sleep early and wake up early. Although not uh-huh. my grandma, she's 88 and she goes to bed at like midnight. And I think I want to be cool like her one day. Mm, I think you're right. Anyway. But I also want to get back to what we were talking about with Laura. Cause I want to yeah. hone in on something. Let's focus Laura, on the topic. That, uh, Laura, something that you said, kind of like the whole message of the podcast that you've been sharing so far, I think really embodies beautifully, like the scientific approach to raising children. Well, um, sorry, I had to go there. But what you were saying was that, you know, there's these different profiles of children. There's like, it's not just that every child applies to a wake window of one hour and 20 minutes when they are four months old. That's just not how children work. Although lots of people try to tell us that that's exactly what children need. They must sleep for 40 minutes. If they wake up before 40 minutes, they have slept too little and you must put them back to sleep again all of these kinds of things. But what I think um, you kind of talk about and embody a lot is that it's the observation, it's the exploration, it's the just approach it with curiosity and wonder, see if it works. Well, it didn't. Okay, let's, tomorrow's a new day. Let's try something different or let's try it again, but slightly differently. Like, let's just explore, let's test, let's wonder about whether this child needs this or that or something else um and ex- instead of trying to force a um, square peg into a round hole aka a child that has one type of preference for sleep into the normative desirable western desire for sleep um let's try and find what works for them and makes mum and baby and dad and whoever else is in that household happy because everyone's on the same page about what each person needs for sleep. I think that's a really beautiful idea. Yeah. And that's, you know, again, I feel like because we're a scientist and maybe we forget to mention it, but I do believe that there are patterns like, but I just don't think there's one. I think there's many. And as you're saying, experimenting allows you to decode your own child, find their own code And of course, you know, and I think that's another thing about sleep training. Why is it so popular? Because there has been a lot of children that were uh, compatible with these rhythms. But does that mean that then they were for everyone? No, absolutely not. And um, going back to Siobhan's late question about uh, highly sensitive kids, um, I'm so tired of people telling parents that they need to train them to sleep in the light and with the vacuum going on. Um, like there are kids who will never, ever sleep with the noise or the light, even for naps. And um, no, it's not going to affect their melatonin levels uh, if they sleep in the dark for naps and all these kind of things. Um, again, these rules are just so old fashioned and I understand the logic of it all, but it's just like, look at your child it's just like I know that my child she never she never slept in the noise like it's just it's something actually recently she got really sick um we still don't know what it was I think there was hand mouth foot going around um I was trying to wake her up from a three-hour nap you know the thing that never happens at seven year old um (laughs) And I opened the blinds and there was bright light and she was sleeping. I can tell you, I took a million pictures because this never happens in my life. Like, (laughs) no, like I don't have pretty sleeping pictures of my child because she will be in the full darkness and there's no way I'll have a picture. But we really need to break those walls and just find, like tell parents to find the code of their own children. They're unique and there are a lot of patterns because we talk only about a few and there are millions of other and probably some that I've never even encountered yet, you know? Absolutely. And I think that's so important to remember. And I think I understand, like you say, you understand the logic behind these things. And I completely agree that when we're in the depths and in the trenches of trying to figure out our parent, um, sorry, figure out our parenting for our little ones, particularly when they're like newborns and we're handed this baby and sent home from the hospital and go, oh no, what have I signed up for? We want answers because we feel lost. We feel like we don't know what to do. Um, so it's 
very appealing to be drawn to these kind of one size fits all answers. Um, and it's, it's less comforting to be told, well, just pay attention to your baby and see what they need. And I think I talked about this in last week's episode. I remember people asking me very kindly, oh, what do you think the baby needs as a new parent? And I'm going, I have no idea. Why are you asking me? Um, I found it very confronting when really they were doing exactly what they should have been. Um, but I felt so ill-equipped. And so having someone, an expert, confidently say, what you need to do is follow this thing. Um, so I completely see the appeal. And I, like you, don't judge anyone for sleep training because for a lot of kids, it quote unquote works in that having some kind of pattern or routine can be helpful. It's where we start to try to shove kids into a a thing that doesn't fit and obviously doesn't work for them. And then worse still, chastise parents for not following through or not like trying hard enough when really they're doing exactly what they should be doing and listening to their own gut and listening to their own child and their needs. Um, and I think, I don't know, I don't know how we get this message out any more loudly. Um, that's not a question. That's just a, a sad state of affairs that I think like finding ways to equip parents with the confidence that they know their child best is probably the easiest way to do it. I think um, another thing, and I still feel it as a mom of a, I'll say just one child, even though I don't think it's little, you know, because I still believe that you struggle with one, two, three, or even zero kids, you know, you have your own problems. Um, but uh, I feel like the decision fatigue, like obviously the mental charge, but the decision fatigue is still really an ongoing battle. Um, and I don't know if it's because I'm also sensitive neurodivergent, that it's just like too much for my brain. Uh, but even recently, like we were going to have a shower with my daughter and um, you know, Japanese uh, bathrooms, you you just shower all together, which I think I think that should be something around the world to make life easier for moms. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I was my my husband was cooking on the other side of the wall, and I'm like, does she need to have her hair washed? And he's like, you decide. And I'm like, no, you decide. Just tell me what <laughs> to do. Tell. Like, just tell me. I'll do it. I don't care. And this is something that I have felt a lot as a mom. I would say, you know, like even just carrying the camera to keep a watch of the child. Like, I remember when I finally separated this device from my body and be like, okay, I don't need to keep a watch all the time. He's going to do it. Like all these kind of things where... Um, it, it gave me a little bit more life and you know again we don't talk a lot about this thing you know the mom instinct uh, the, this connection where it's like it never stops you know it starts mm -hmm. it never stops and then you're exhausted and it's really hard to explain it to uh, non-moms or sometimes dads really don't get it where it's like you do not understand even if I'm out in the shop after you know my child is finally one year old there's no way I'm going to enjoy myself no way <laughs> no I feel that deep deep in my soul on so many levels the decision fatigue is exhausting I've had the same conversation with my husband being like no I'm not I'm not making this decision I cannot physically make any more decisions today I am the default parent I carry the cognitive load I organize the Christmas presents I organize all of the outings like I just I cannot do it so you need to decide and I do it a lot more often now because I'm just like no like you are capable of making decisions for our child as well you don't have to always defer to me you are excellent as a parent um, but it's still really hard the detachment of the monitor I watched that goddamn monitor I watched her chest move up and down for a year mm. and like I'm an indicator of my postpartum anxiety but when I didn't have to carry that monitor around all the time was bliss but I think one of the things that makes um, infant sleep so different is that parenting is relentless and sleep is the only reprieve that you have from that mm. relentless demand and that guilt and but when you have a wakeful baby, I had a baby that napped for 23 minutes, three times a day from the moment she was born. I had an infant that woke 12 night, times a night. So there was no break. There was, it was just constantly relentless and it was all on me because she wouldn't go to anyone else. Um, and I was anxious. So I just let it happen. And I think that relentlessness, like you characterize it well, it, it doesn't end. And it's part of the reason that we have parents that seek 
answers and simple answers and someone to tell them what to do with their baby because they can't make that decision for themselves because they're so tired. They just need someone else to break the relentless exhaustion and to make the decision for them. So I understand how it happens and how it permeates culture, but we just need more voices saying, let me make a decision for you and your child. And that decision is today, you're going to try this. If that doesn't Mm. work tomorrow, try this. And because I think that's what parents need. If I had someone just like being like, okay, now you watch her, just watch her. What does she do? Okay. So she, when she's in the cot, she does this. Okay. That's probably telling you what. I don't know. It's probably telling you she's not comfortable and just having someone like walk through those things with you when you're so exhausted and so tired Mm -hmm. sounds like bliss. Anyways, sorry. I'm I'm pretty sure I'm going to forget myself if I don't say it because I I, I wanted to do a reel about it and I still haven't, but I have a tip for the baby monitor that I haven't shared with anyone. And I'm pretty sure no one knows about this. Um, PJs with glitter. And I'm not talking like sparkle because you don't want the kids to eat it, but the glitter shows in the dark night of the camera. So you will see the chest of the baby move when the PJ has glitter on it. Um, And this is, yes, yes. And again, it was really accidental that I find it out. And I was like, oh, I need to propagate this information because, you know, even if it's just checking once in a while because sometimes you're like it's not moving it's not moving is it moving you know (laughs) and you have to keep watching and and accidentally more recently like my daughter was five or something I bought her gap I think there was like a lion and the the little the little things were glitter and and I could see her moving I'm like oh my goodness I wish I knew that before so for everyone listening buy buy glitter pjs to your to your kids um and the other thing I wanted to say is uh, I have an amazing client at the moment. Um, she's actually a psychologist, but for adults. So she came to me and she was like, you know, I don't do kids and stuff. But um, we talked about the emotions and uh, letting the emotions happen. Because a lot of the time when we talk more about the nervous system, we want the nervous system to be dialed down as much as possible throughout the day. Of course, they'll have all the emotions, but you want them to be able to express it all, have it all out, accept it, have all the empathy you can as much as possible. I always tell parents, if you need to divert, just be ready for it to come up again later and you know but uh this mom um she was telling me something incredible through the work we're doing together where she said that you know I, I i told her you know just let it happen and so she used to kind of try to keep her 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 daughter in her arms you know throughout the tantrum or whatever um and so she started just kind of like letting her safely because that's the other thing during tantrums you want to keep your child safe um let her on the bed or wherever have her tantrum and the the little child would be like oh and then suddenly realize and want to come cuddle back Mm -hmm. but the incredible thing is that this child this daughter um she did not like cuddles until that moment where Mm. she realized the power of the cuddle and she started asking it from other people as well which was one thing the mom wanted to work on where she was the sole responsible for all the emotional outbursts and everything and suddenly the daughter would ask cuddles from dad from grandma and stuff like that because she suddenly found out what it could do for her and I was Mm. like this is exactly you know when we talk about the balance of emotions boundaries and all these kind of things this is where we're going towards like the child is going to be not emotionally independent by any means, but just start realizing how it can make her feel so that she knows what she might need. And the mom was like, she, it was huge. I mean, I don't know if people listening realize how huge this can be where, you know, um, you can offer something else than your breast and, and things like that. And, and just like this emotional development that can happen again when you experiment and you also allow your child to show you the way kind of um 
And the other thing is the sleep was not perfect, still not perfect for, for this mom, whatever perfect means. Um, but when we talked this time, I was like, you know, you, you understand that with what you've been going on right now, even if we stopped today, um, we still had a few sessions together. Um, in two, three months, gradually, just because of what you're doing right now, the sleep is going to improve because mm. you're doing this foundation, which is the most important for sleep. Um, yeah, so that was a, that was an amazing thing I wanted to, <laughs> to discuss with all this emotional. I can't even remember what it was related to before, but it's it made sense in my head. <laughs> oh, no, it makes perfect sense. And I think you make such a brilliant point. And it kind of ties back to what I was saying earlier about how I was so intent on rocking Timo to sleep when that clearly wasn't what he needed and I think so often as parents we get caught up in this and I do it all the time we get caught up in this thing of I know what my child needs or I know you're going to need this so let's not waste the time and let's just jump into it and I'll give you what you're going to need when often they need to, they need to get there in their own time and in their own way which is how learning happens right like it's how even us as adults we hate it when someone jumps the gun and tells us okay well let's just skip all this process and get to the end of the game when we need to go through the process to properly appreciate the benefits of doing things in a particular way and I think you're totally right is that it's not about like um, giving it's not even about giving control to our children even though sometimes that's beneficial it's about letting them lead the way and us being the ones that kind of guides and frames things with their direction and their cues yeah I definitely agree I think the sentiment that often goes around like we love short phrases is watch and wait just watch mm. and wait don't leap don't interfere um, always watch and wait, watch with curiosity and wonder. I will always talk about curiosity and wonder, approach things with curiosity mm -hmm. and wonder and watch and wait, give them a second. Uh, is your baby crying? Have they woken up? Watch and wait, give them 30 seconds. Don't leap into bed and wake them up. Um, is your child playing and they're frustrated? Watch and wait. Will they solve it for themselves? This builds their ability to tolerate frustration um, I mean, we're working on an experiment at the moment where we're looking at children's private speech, which is um, private mm. speech is this really adorable thing where kids actually say their thoughts out loud um, between the ages of three and five. Like, it's so cute. It starts to internalize. Um, and we're trying to look at how private speech develops based on the type of parenting style you use. Um, mm. But there's all this data, like kids just like have a huge variability depending on how much frustration tolerance they have, but we give them these really hard tasks. And then we see like what their private speech is like. And you'll just have these kids who are super frustrated and call for help really quickly. But you'll also have these kids who are really frustrated, but they keep working on it themselves and they talk themselves through it. So if you watch and wait and you give your child the opportunity, you might see them have this really adorable conversation, hyping themselves up. Like you can do it. You can do it. So anyways, yeah, that's just my watch and wait. <laughs> monologue. Did you see this, um, this reel about this little, I can't even remember how old this really young child was on the skis and there's a microphone and uh, yeah, they're I saw talking it. it's to themselves so cute. and they're like, yeah, mm. go, go, you can do it, you can jump in. And then I was like, oh my goodness, I wish I was so, you know, I wish I had no. such a good inner dialogue for myself too. Mm. I have that when in dialogue it's for myself, beautiful. but usually it's in the middle of a panic attack, but it works. Those, you've got this. <laughs> like I have my own private speech, but it is internalized in my brain and it's not out loud. Um, but yes, that is an adorable reel. I hope we can find it and put it in the show notes, but um, well, I hope so. I'll see, I'll see if I can find it. It's really cute. I think they, they fall over or stumble at one stage and then they go, it's okay. Everybody falls. It's so, it's just so cute. We'll Tell have me you have a it. child with low emotional ability and high um, endorsement from their parents without telling me anyway, sorry, that was a bit too sciencey for you guys. Right. Um, right. No, I love it. <laughs> but anyways, We've been talking for a very long time, so I'm sadly going to put an end to this conversation, even though I'm really enjoying it. Um, if you guys want to hear more from Laura, you can always yell at us um, to bring her back on the pod. Um, but thank you so much for coming on and nerding out with us um, as a fellow scientist. We love it.
Thanks so much for having me. Um, this is my favorite thing. Honestly, like I, I love the holistic sleep community and holistic parenting community, but especially when I get to talk to other experts like this, and I know that you guys have different perspective and different experiences and um, I, lo I love learning from you, you guys and from everyone else from the community and, you know, finding those little tips like, you know, wear PJs with glitters like this is the kind of thing I love <laughs> um, to share and to just discuss but the science is my favorite well, we love you so that much for joining us Laura we love to pick your brain yes it was amazing thank you so much Laura I'm sure we'll chat to you again soon bye I can't wait welcome back <laughs> that was so awkward Siobhan and I were just staring at each other I looked like I was going to talk but then she looked like she was going to talk so I think um neither of us spoke but anyways welcome back I hope you enjoyed the episode with Laura it was pretty good like we're not as chaotic as we used to be I've been holding my tongue a lot more like we took ah. turns we like us? we tried except for the first I jumped the gun at the beginning. But apart from that, we took turns. I'm proud we, of us. Yeah, look, uh, someone has offered to help us with um, podcast quality, guys. We know we're going to take them up on it. I am going to respond very enthusiastically to the offer because um, we don't know what we're doing. Uh, and oh, it's no. probably about time that we fixed it. But neither of us has any time to like <laughs> do anything else. Um, but that's okay because we're going to uh, get more help. Um, we've already made a one positive step and that was hiring our producer, um, our volunteer producer, Ellen. We love you, Ellen. you, Ellen. We are so glad you are here. Without you, season two would not exist. Um, but anyways, that was a wonderful talk with Laura. I mean, we already told you that at the start of the episode, but like, I really liked it. It was great. I mean, she's a wonderful person. She's so intelligent and clever and really grounded, which I appreciate. Um, it's and is like not terribly easy to find in the space of social media. Like she just has a really beautiful attitude that like everybody's different. There's no one way of doing things. There's no black and white. And I really um, that's one of like my favorite things about mm -hmm. her. And then like just in general, mm -hmm. as, as soon as I hear someone spouting that kind of talk, I'm like, good, you and I can be friends. Yeah, we are best friends now. I don't care if you don't agree. We are now best friends yeah. um, <laughs> because you are my people. But no, that's, it's very true. Like those people are hard to find because they're not clickbaity. Like they're not divisive. Mm. They're just like, feels like coming home. Like you said, you feel safe. So if you want to find a safe space on the internet, someone like Laura is a part of that safe space. I feel like it's time for us to make like, a safe space community like where we just have like a list of people who like we think is safe <laughs> that would be so know. good too many ideas um no I love but it. anyways Siobhan what's your fun fact Friday for Tuesday oh, why do you always make me go first well, I don't um, have to <laughs> yeah you go first um okay what am I going to do so I'm working on a Santa story at the, like a Santa like I don't even know what it is like a media piece with my university at the moment I don't know oh, cool uh, I have friends in the media department and he was just like can we do Santa and I was like yes we can I will find the science and do you know how hard it is to find the science of like why Santa is bad because no one's done it no one's game to take on yeah. jolly old Saint Nick and his threat of understand. coal as a bad thing but yeah. like essentially what we know there's a few things we know there's a little bit of science so the positives of santa are that children actually behave behave more generous generously after thinking about santa this is a really old study it really needs to be replicated because it was a very small sample and there was different findings depending on whether the child was five or six um if they were yeah. six they were more generous after thinking about santa they gave more lollies to children with disabilities if they were five they gave the same amount of lollies to everyone but that kind of like that happens with all kinds of generosity as children age they get more generous in their donations um so that's interesting um we take that study with a grain of salt because it's very old and very small and some weird findings but it's fun nonetheless um the other one that I found really interesting um all of the Santa studies are really old like this one's from 94 like people just mm. were like Santa is too good I found more 
joke journal articles about Santa oh, and how he travels, yeah. like time dilation and things, then, and they, they masquerade <laughs> as being so serious. They're in proper journals. Like it's, it's very confusing. That's but anyways, awesome. this one from 94 <laughs> um, talks about whether Santa, discovering that Santa is a myth is distressing. And what they find is that in just one study though, most children report positive reactions to finding out that Santa is a myth. And they have very minimal distress. They like report like less than 10% like capacity, like not capacity, like 10% val- like intensity of emotions. That's the one, how intense their emotions are. They're at like 10% out of a hundred. Um, however, parents said that they were more upset. So 40% of parents said that they were sad that their children no longer believe in Santa. Mm, um, yeah. But almost, almost all children said that they would teach their own child about the myth of Santa after finding out that it wasn't true. Yeah. And I think like that's sweet and happy and I'm so glad. Like there's obviously still going to be a minority of children that find it extremely traumatic. Um but yeah, I Have think you heard about that family. There's this family, I listened to a podcast episode about it once, mm. where basically the parents like did the Santa myth, but like on steroids up to like 10,000%, where they like had all of this mythology that they had created themselves around it. Like they had a sleigh that broke outside and like, like they took it to crazy levels. They had neighbors in on the, in on it and they had it until like the kids were teenagers. Like it was insane. Those children were very traumatized Mm -mm. by the, the length, (laughs) the lengths that their parents went to lie. And the point, like even just listening to it as a, like as a listener, I'm like, whoa, your parents were crazy so mm-hmm. I can understand why you'd be upset but yeah. you're absolutely right that is not most children's experience mm-hmm. and I remember being so excited when I found out that Santa wasn't real I, I was remember stoked. just like I just quietly moved on I like saw presents in my parents room and then like on Christmas morning they said that they were from Santa and I was like oh okay <laughs> like <laughs> I see what you've done there I still like I don't know why but I hedge it with my kid I'm just like yeah, some people believe in Santa. And I don't know if it's because I say the same thing about religion and other people's attitudes. Like I tend to imbue, mm. I'm, I'm a head, like I'm a scientist. We, we hedge everything. So I mm. like to imbue um, the things that I say to her with like, you know, a note of like, it could be different. Like you're allowed to think differently. Some people believe that um, this is what Santa does. Um, I do talk about the fact that shopping Santa Santa um is mm-hmm. is shopping center santa it's different um mm-hmm. <laughs> is, I, I don't know why i just seem to um i do know there was one study i was reading that said that the more instances of santa children see in real life the more likely they are to really endorse that santa is real um mm-hmm. and then then there was a study um out of our old university our old lab with uh rowan Corpetan mm. and like Nicole mm. Nelson and stuff looking at like it's called the children's pantheon which is a fun name um, but it looks at like the hierarchical belief systems like of children in terms of like fictional or no longer existing agents and um, Santa Claus falls below dinosaurs I think um, ah. and like a- around the same like level as the tooth fairy and the Easter bunny so yeah I think Makes Santa sense. Claus is more um more strongly maintained because there's more time around it, more effort put into yeah. it. Um, yeah. But yeah, it still sits below dinosaurs, which is awesome because dinosaurs did exist. Um, well, they just, yeah, we've we been evidence of Tim it. Has been, he's been questioning a lot. He's like, dinosaurs are real? And it's like, they were real. <laughs> but can I tell you um, yes. regarding Santa Claus, thankfully, so he's very pro Santa Claus at the moment is constantly mm-hmm. asking us why Santa Claus can't be here now mm-hmm. to deliver the, the long list of presents he's requested. Mm-hmm. Oh my. Um, he's made us write three different letters. Um, it's it, yeah, I mean, it is sweet, but it's mostly just materialistic on his part, which is also fine. Mm. Also, um, I, have, I have an exception on that too, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. Uh, perfect. Um, but about maybe two months ago, because his birthday is the day after Christmas, there's lots of um, conversation around when you're three, it's just after Christmas. So the conversation around Christmas has been going for a long time. Mm. And about three months ago, we talked about Santa Claus or someone brought it up. And then not long after, he seemed to be very scared of Santa. 
Aww. and we're like why he's like santa will hurt me it's, it's, it's scary it's 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 bad santa's bad he, and we're like going what is going on like where did this come from who is mm-hmm. talking to you about santa and putting this in and then we sat him down and was we we're trying to get to the bottom of it and we said why why is santa scary he said santa has claws and santa- then <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah how good and so Santa Claus, he rightly assumed that Santa was a big, Santa was a big scary monster with claws. Uh, so we had to explain that that is not the case. Um, and it's just, again, another beautiful example of how my toddler's brain works with his hilarious interpretations of things. Oh, my God. I honestly just, I love where their brains are at now. Like three is like mm-hmm. peak, like misconception, like language mm-hmm. hilarity kind of zone. So like if you don't have a three-year-old yet, wait for it um they are just like their behavior like last night my kid was just like she was dancing to push it and like she was <laughs> naked in front of the tv singing the words just like pumping it up like I was just like where did you learn to dance like this and then this morning <laughs> she requested it again at the, at the breakfast table and like at one point she just had her eyes closed and she was just like grooving for like a good five minutes and I was like who are you like so good wow so yeah it was Like, it's very interesting how they change. But anyways, that's Santa stuff. The other thing I will say is that um, research has looked at what children prefer at different ages in terms of presents, whether they are Mm -hmm. um, material things or experiences. And it finds that children between three and 12 tend to prefer materialistic things. We know that children Mm -hmm. like to collect things. Um, It might have a lot to do with their cognitive development and their inability to future forecast and things like that. Um, and that might be why they don't really value futuristic things, uh, like experiential experiential things in the future as much. But like it almost, it completely flips. When they turn 12 up to like 18, mm. they prefer experiences more. And I think adults also experience, like also mm-hmm. prefer experiences more. Um, but yeah, I just thought that was a fun, like little side note to make you feel l- a little bit less guilty about the fact that you are buying a stack of toys. If that is something that you want to do, if that's something that you can afford to do, feel less guilty about it because in the end like you're not the only one kids tend to prefer that and if it brings you joy that's something you can do what has Tima requested <laughs> oh the a long list it's slightly it, it it's got a few core ones that stay the same there's a little bit of mixing around the edges of changing things but um a digger a skip truck not not a not a dump truck a skip truck so it's a, okay a, truck yep. that the sledder like a skip sits on top they don't really exist they so don't. we're trying really hard <laughs> to find one um a bobcat a trench digger um a what else um there's basically if you use if it's a construction um machine or a, a, a um a digger witch a witch digger which is a specific type of trench digger uh he probably oh. won't be getting it because they don't it's like an actual machine they don't make children's toys versions of it so um yeah that he's kind of yeah just machinery focused mm, yeah that that makes sense I mean mine is very like robot toy focused she loves anything that like responds to her um but also like something that she did request was like a, a robotic dinosaur and I was like oh for oh, god's sakes those definitely exist I know they're very cheap it came up but like also noise but anyways oh, yes the one thing I did find that I reckon he'd like to sorry like this is total side note now no. we're just Christmas shopping but you guys will love it too <laughs> um it's like on Amazon there's this thing I'll put it in the show notes don't worry I'll link it in the show notes um it is like this little dinosaur construction kit so like it's got like little screws and stuff um to put the dinosaurs together but it has like an electric drill I saw this we've bought it for my um for my nephew yeah on Amazon I think that's what he's getting I I live on Amazon um but yeah it's like 37 dollars and it's just what's it called assembled dinosaurs like I I don't know but it's got like a bunch of screwdrivers and a couple of like attachments for a drill, which they've called it like they've called the screwdrivers a hand drill. <laughs> Just that's oh, how you know that it's not, not a great translation. But like you can put together like T Rexes and stuff. And like she so loves good. fixing things. So I was like, she's going to mm. love putting it together and pulling it apart. Like she's going to make us put it together. But yeah, that might also be a thing for like your little guy. I don't know. Anyways, 
Yeah, no, I love it. He's um he's got a version of that, but it's you put together and pull apart construction toys. It's from yeah. Kmart, twenty five bucks. It's very mm. good. Comes with a drill, so he needs a dinosaur yes. version of that. He's been very into. Oh, he's been into like the dinosaur sharks. It's like all of the ancient sharks. So the plesiodons. Plesiosaurs. Uh, yes, and Sorry, the, not dons. Um, plesiosaurs. The, that's what they are. Oh, his dad mostly reads this book, so I can't remember. But there, there's the helicoprion, which has like a spiral tooth situation uh, wow. which is really weird and so he laughs and goes funny helicoprion silly teeth <laughs> oh like I know that the ones that are in the in, that that swim are like the the like the dinosaur like branch is plesiosaur mm-hmm. which is different oh from yep. dinosaur and then you've got the ones that fly are the pterosaurs so there's three different mm. types pterosaurs dinosaurs and plesiosaurs um, so he's, it sounds like he's into the plesiosaurs. Very much so. Yes. yes anyway, yes. now we're just talking about Sorry. our children's special interest, which is also <laughs> mine. Um, I do have a teeny fun fact that I've mm-hmm. just looked up. Um, it's a paper that came out yesterday. Oh. Talking about do more hours in center-based care cause oh. more externalizing behavior problems mm-hmm. across national replication study. What's your hypothesis? Do you think it's um, long hours in daycare cause more problems or not? Oh, well, what I was going to say is that it's our assigned reading for the journal club. I just haven't sent it out because we do journal club every oh, week now. So that's going to the amazing. journal club next week. Oh, well, then um, I, I won't spoil it. But I haven't read it. Like, so oh, no. like, oh, sorry, friends. Um, I was going to ask you, Siobhan, and I guess I'm now mm. asking you live on air. Can we drop our journal club recordings into the Parenting Unpacked pod feed? I think that's a marvelous idea. We shall do that then. We shall be dropping the journal club feed, the journal club episodes into the feed I'll make sure that they say journal club on them so if you don't want to engage in listening to a bunch of scientists critique a specific article um you don't have to click on it but yeah that's that way we can actually dive into um that article next week awesome idea yeah it was so much fun journal club was just the best I'm just so sad that the time doesn't work for me I'll have to try that's People okay. did jump in late though. Siobhan works in the mornings and Journal Club is on at 11 a.m. on a Tuesday. Um, so yeah, I, I you yeah, maybe like maybe, maybe you'll catch maybe. the end we'll of it. We we'll see. But anyways, I think that's it. We're kind of just basically catching up now. Um, so <laughs> thank you for listening to our rambles. As per usual, we promise we are getting help with the quality of the podcast. Please bear with us. We thank you so much for hanging around as long as you have. We do. Uh, we do. Yeah. We're very grateful. Yes. Anything else, Siobhan? No, nope. I think that's, that's everything. It. Well, let's say goodbye. See you, crew. Bye. Bye.